The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. The obedience of one man, Noah. Throughout the Bible, we see where one person made a difference. And certainly here in Genesis chapter 6, as we read about Noah, he makes a difference. Obeying God is number one in our walk with him. We see this reoccurring point as we look at the story of the flood. And by the way, it was the flood that we read about in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. It was a true story. It is not just a fairy tale. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Peter writes this, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by what? By water. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, listen at what Peter says. The light figure, whereunto even baptism does now also now save us. Not putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward who? Toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what is said about Noah in Genesis 2, 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah was obedient to God. He trusted God. He did exactly what God had told him to do. Matter of fact, that's exactly what faith is. Faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We often say a good way to view faith is the APR, active, positively responding to God's word. And that's exactly what Noah did. He made a difference because he was obedient to God. My first point is that in the sixth chapter of Genesis, we see the mindset of the people in that day. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, the Bible reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him It is hard. Can you imagine as we stop there? The imagination of man's heart was evil continuously. We must make sure that we meditate on the right thing. The Bible says that we are to meditate on God's word day and night. Paul mentions in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, where he says, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if that be any virgin, any praise, he mentions to think of these things. We must make sure that our imagination does not get away from us, that we feed our minds with God's word, that we feed our minds with things that are pleasant and things that are right, that we'll stay away from anything that may cause us to have the wrong mindset or the wrong heart. The Bible goes on to say in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Can you imagine in verse 6, he says, It repented God that he had made man. man. God was so disappointed. So when we sin, we not only sin 
against ourselves and others, but we sin against God. We hurt God. And prior to us sinning, let us think about that. Let us think of the fact that sin has sad consequences. And here we see a sad commentary about man. And the Lord said, I will destroy man in verse number seven, whom I have created from the face of the earth. But man, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah, thank God for one man, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You can make a difference no matter where you are. Just live right and do right. And God can use you, you as an earthen vessel. As an earthen vessel. The Bible says that we are earthen vessels. God used Paul in the New Testament in Acts chapter 9 as an earthen vessel to preach to the Gentiles, to go before kings. And here, God uses Noah to build an ark to save those that were willing to be obedient to him. In Genesis 6, verse number 8, we see there is hope in one man, and that man is Noah. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was the last of the pre-flood patriots and builder of the ark that survived the great flood. Remember we said there are three ages, the patriarchal age, then you have the Mosaic age, then you have the Christian age. We're now living in the Christian age. Noah was living in the patriarchal age where God spake through the heads of the household. He is speaking now through Noah as he builds this ark. He was 600 years old, Noah was when the flood began and lived to be 950 years of age. Back then, God built, built man so well, it took him many years to wind down. But after Adam and Eve sinned, man began to die physically and spiritually. In Genesis chapter 6, verse number 9, he is described as a righteous man, a righteous man. It is so important to be a righteous person. Remember, even Job, in Job chapter 1, he was an upright and righteous man. The Bible tells us that we are to seek the kingdom of God. In, in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We are to be righteous. We are to live righteous. We see in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, the centurion, he was a good man, but he was not a righteous man. He prayed to God. He gave to the poor. But in order for him to be righteous, he had to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. This very moment, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not righteous yet. You must hear the word, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be baptized, and all your past sins will be washed away. And you will become a righteous person, and you will continue to walk in the newness of life. But he is described as a righteous man. As I mentioned earlier, a man of obedience. In verse 22, the Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, that Noah, Noah, notice what it says, that Noah, he did according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He was a righteous man, and he was an obedient man. The writer of Hebrews paints him as a man of faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7. By faith, Noah, being one of God of things not seen as yet. Now, God warned him that a flood was coming, but it had not been rain. At that point, it was just a mist coming from the ground at that point. No one had never seen rain. And can you imagine 
how strange it was to build this big boat when there has never been rain. But Noah, the Bible says, being one of God of things not seen as yet. Notice what I said about faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But Noah went on the instructions of God. So there's not blind faith. We go on the instructions of God. Some people in the denominational world, they just say, I'm jumping out on faith into the dark. No, but God gives us direction and instruction. And so we go out on that trust that he has given us, that he's going to take care of us, and that we just do exactly what he told us to do. And this is what Noah is doing. He's doing exactly what God has told him to do. Being one of God, things not seen as yet. How, what did he do? He would move with fear. See, faith causes us to move. We don't get stagnated. We don't go in neutral. We move. We step out on faith. We move forward on belief into what God has told us to do. Yet move with fear. What did he do? Prepare an art to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. They had a choice. They had a choice to come on the inside of that boat, of the ark, or to stay on the outside. Remember we said that God does not make us robot. We are free moral agents. We are able to have the power of choice. God has given us the power of choice, and we can make that decision. They made a decision back then not to do what was right. Noah made a decision to do exactly what God had told him to do, even though there was uh, not rain at that point. But he believed whatever God told him, and he did what God told him to do. Because we don't know what's ahead, but God does. We don't know what's in tomorrow, what's on tomorrow, but we know God is in tomorrow. How did the New Testament writers refer to uh, him, Noah. They referred to Noah as an actual person. He was a person. It is a real story. When we read Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 and 38, the Bible says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, how would this be? For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating. There's nothing wrong with eating. But what the Bible is showing us, they were going along with their daily activity. They felt like nothing would happen, like people are today. They feel like, well, since the sun is coming up in the morning and the, the sun is going down in the evening, there's day and night, and things are still going on as planned and different things are happening, that everything is going to be all right and nothing is going to happen. So I can just live and do what I want to do. But notice what happens here. Days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and what else? Marrying. There's nothing wrong with eating, drinking, and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Let us read Luke 17, verse 26 and 27. Luke says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, when the Son of Man should come back, People will go, be going about doing the things that they normally do. That's why the Bible says watch and pray, that we enter not into temptation. That's why the Bible also says that no one knows the hour when the Lord should come back. We just must always be ready, always be ready. In Luke 17, verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. He was 
also noted as one that preached righteousness to his generation. And oh, what a wonderful compliment. Righteousness is very important. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, and spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Genesis 6, 3 tells us his preaching was 120 years. How do we know that? Because God is long suffering. And God is saying that my spirit will not scribe with man forever. Even today, God is going to come back for those that love him. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6, as Paul talks about the end. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished the course and I kept the faith. And hence it's later for me, it's a crown of righteousness, but, but not for me only, but all those that love his appearance. The Lord is coming back, and we are to be righteous when he comes back. Noah shows, my third point, obedience in making the ark. He shows obedience in making the ark. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 14, these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man and a perfect in his generation and Noah, what did he do? He walked with God. It's a wonderful thing to walk with God. John, in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7, it mentions how we can walk with the Lord like Noah, Adam, and Eve did in Genesis chapter 3. They really walked with the Lord. We see that even before they sinned, they walked with the Lord. But here we see in the New Testament that we can also walk with the Lord. In 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all our sins. How do we walk in the Lord? By making decisions according to God's word. By walking in the light, walking in the light of God's word. The Bible says that Noah, he walked with God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse number 10, And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In verse number 11 in Genesis chapter 6, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. We see it even in our generation, in our day and time. How the earth is filled with violence. That was years ago when you did not even have to lock your car. Do you have to do that now? You didn't even have to lock your house. As I grew up as a teenager, we didn't have to lock our houses. But now you do. Because there's so much violence all around. Back then, the earth was filled with violence. In Genesis chapter 6, verse number 12, the Bible says, And God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupt his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Then he tells Noah to do this in verse number 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Noah had to make that art exactly what the way God told him to make it and with God, what God told him to make it with. Make me an art of gopher wood. Had he used pine or anything else, it would not have been according to God's will. God has a reason to tell us, to instruct us to do things in a certain way. This is kind of wood that God wanted the art made out of. Keep in mind, God knows better. Make thee an art of gopher wood. Then it goes on to say, Rooms shall thou make in the art, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Similar to the tar that we have on our roads. 
In Genesis chapter 6, verses number 15 through 17. And this is the fashion which thou shall make it of. God had it all laid out. He said the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A wonder, a wonder, notice now, a wonder shall thou make to the ark. Now Noah could have wanted to make many wonders, but God said make a wonder. He had to do exactly what the way God told him to make it. And in a cubit shall thou finish it above. And the door, now the door, only one door, and this is why we see in the New Testament in John chapter 10, verses number 1 through 10, Christ says, I am the door. There's only one door. Christ is the door. And on that ark, there was only one door. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof. Well, lower Second and third stories shall thou make it. In Genesis chapter 6, verse number 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now notice this. God is going to bring a flood. It will be 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible in Genesis chapter 7 says that the windows of heaven opened. It wasn't just a spring shower. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It really rained. Notice what happens here. The water causes the ark to float on top of the water like a boat. Those that were on the outside of the ark perished. They perished because they were not on the inside of the ark. When Peter tells us, as we read earlier, that they were saved by water, they were saved by water in that the water lifted up the ark. Now, those that were outside of the ark perished by water. That's why we read earlier in Mark 16, 15, and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. Those that were on the outside of the ark were condemned. Those that are on the outside of the church will be condemned. Because Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is God's ark now in the New Testament. You must be in the church, the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13, we've been translated in the kingdom of his dear son, and his dear son is Jesus, him crucified. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 8, in Genesis chapter 8, what happened as they come off of this ark. They were on this ark for over a year because it took a long period of time over a year for the water in order for the water to recede. The earth will fill, fill with water after 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse number 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savior. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The Bible says here the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, not from his birth. This is why a child is safe in the arms of God. But when a child gets to be, uh, get to a point where they know right from wrong, they must hear the word, believe it, repent, and be baptized and become a member of the Lord's church. Neither will I, again, in verse 21 in Genesis chapter 8, neither will I, again, smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. God 
shows us this by giving a rainbow. All the time we see that rainbow, and that, that is a reminder of God's promise that the earth would not be destroyed by water anymore. Here in the New Testament in 1 Peter, the Bible says that the earth would be destroyed and melted and the works therein. This is why we must all strive to get to heaven because there will come a day when people will be eating, marrying, and doing all those different things like we're doing now, going about their daily business, and the Lord will come like a twinkling of an eye. The question is, will you be ready? Will you be ready when the Lord shall come? As we conclude, many of us know the rest of this great story. Only eight souls were saved, Noah and his family. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that only a few are going to be saved. Only a few are going to be saved. You can be in that few by really being obedient like Noah was. Being obedient to God. In spite of the environment, in spite of what the world is doing, you can still do what's right by hearing God's word, believing it, repenting of your sin, confessing Christ, and being baptized. The Lord shut the door in Genesis 7, 16, and he shut the door, and everybody that was on the outside of that door was, were lost. You can be on the inside of the door of the Lord's church, the kingdom of God, the pillar and ground of the truth, the manifold wisdom of God, the church of Christ. It is the only one you can read in the Bible. In Romans chapter 16, verse number 16, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Be a part of that kingdom, the church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 21, that the kingdom is the church and the church is the body. And the body is the church. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4, 5, and 6, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one church. Oh, be a part of that church that Jesus died for, and you will be saved. And when the Lord should call, he would say, well done, that good and faithful servant. You've been faithful a few things. I'll make you rule over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. God bless you, and continue to study God's word. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth For The World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious.